Okay, so you have just missed out behind the scenes me having a bit of a meltdown about meeting my idol. <laughs> um, and as you can see, we have proof copies of the book here. And this is Dr. Yanina Ramirez, who is speaking to us this afternoon. And as we can see already in the chat, everyone's saying, hello, Yanina. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm physically here. <laughs> And you've had, the odds. An, you've had a bit of an adventure to get here. I have. You? I've done. I've crossed uh, the river twice to be with you guys today. Um, yeah, it's been a, a catalogue of disasters in quite an amusing way. But fortunately, I'm here, and uh, <laughs> and I got the most warmest welcome ever. So that made it all all the better. And as uh, many of people will be seeing earlier, I wasn't shaking earlier. I am now. Oh, bless. <laughs> so it's very exciting. And your new book sounds incredible, and we're going to be hearing a bit more about that later on. So again, if you do have any questions for Yanina, please do pop them in the Q&A and we will be looking at the computer just here. Mm -hmm. So what made you want to write this book? Oh, well, I have been, um, actually, I had to write a letter to accompany this, weirdly, back to my old college, St Anne's in Oxford. So they found out I'd written this book and they said, oh, Nina, you know, we're so proud of you. You know, St Anne's wants to celebrate you. And they have this magazine called The Ship. And I said, can you just like give us an extract from the book and then write us a little letter to go with it? And I was writing this letter and I was getting all emotional because what I realised was that this book, the seeds for it were sown over 20 years ago when I was an undergrad. Yeah, um, I had this amazing lecturer, Professor Vincent Gillespie. He's the J.R.R. Tolkien professor at Oxford. I mean, what a title is that? Um, and he um, it was him that first put the flame of loving medieval literature into me when I was like 18. And I'd never even heard of Beowulf before I got to university. And suddenly I'm obsessed with old English poetry, the sound of it, the world it conjures up. And he had this thing, he said, Nina, I'm like, because there's a group of us, we called ourselves the medieval nerd group, but there was, you could do English at Oxford, or you could do this thing called course two English. So a thousand people would do English, and then 10 real extreme <laughs> medievalists would do course two. And it was only a small group of us. And he said, I'm gonna put on a week, a lunchtime seminar where I'm gonna look at the mystics. Would you join me? And I was like, yeah, okay. And so I remember there were five of us around a table. And he said, let's read Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love together. And I'd never heard of this book. And I remember opening it and being absolutely blown away by how beautiful it is as a book. And then he said, right, let's meet, read the book of Marjorie Kemp. And in contrast, reading Marjorie after, you know, it's like it's like watching the trickle of French films and then being uh, putting on EastEnders, you know, <laughs> that was the sort of the contrast. And I loved Marjorie so much. Um, and so that was a long time ago. And but what I realized was I came out of those sessions thinking, why the hell don't people know about these women? Why don't they know they exist? I've never heard of them. And I thought, well, I've got to do something about that. So I suppose everything I've been doing since then has been a reaction to that initial feeling of why don't people know this? Mm -hmm. So all the documentaries I've made, you know, podcasts, radio, my lecturing, my writing, all of it has been scratching away at that surface, trying to say to people, no, the Vikings didn't wear horn helmets. No, you know, <laughs> there were women in the medieval period, bizarrely. But I'd never synthesized everything in one place. Mm -hmm. And I realized a few years ago, I'd been doing all these things organically, but I needed to, to put my approach together in a big book that really, I think, could make a difference to how we do history. And that's what this was. And I thought so long and hard about how I was gonna do it because I don't didn't want it to be a series of biographies. You should know what happened to this woman and where she lived. I wanted it to be changing the way we think about our relationship with the past and with the people of the past and putting the individual women in. So there is Hildegarda Bing and there is, um, Marjorie, there are, you know, there are these individuals, but they're part of these complex societies and they're addressing big issues of the time. So they're the frame and then the period comes into view around it. So it's, you know, I think it's different to anything I've done, well, it's certainly different to anything I've done before. I think it's different to anything I've read before. <laughs> I was sort of reading it back the other day going, I can't believe I wrote this, but it's, it's a big book. It's a brave book. Um, and, and I tried to go big. Because I, I, I've only got a short bit of life left, so, you know, who knows how long I've got. If I'm going to write a book, it has to be a big book. Absolutely. <laughs> and I should also say, I'm just going to hold it up to the camera here. It is a big book. There. It's a big book. It's and I think as well, book. you're absolutely right. We have so many of these stories and you have sometimes bit pieces of yeah. someone being mentioned elsewhere. And often we find that they're being mentioned as 
my fault. Or oh, daughter exactly. Of. And that's such a shame because these women are so interesting in their own right. They're not just a wife of or a daughter of or a sister of. And that must have been really rewarding for you when you're researching yourself. Absolutely. I mean, actually, I've got my other book here, which I wrote simultaneously, oh. um, <laughs> uh, which, um, again, you know, I have colleagues that go, what the hell? Nina, just do one thing. I'm like, I can't do one thing. I have to do lots of different things. So this is the book I wrote, Goddess. Um, which is absolutely stunning. And it's 50 goddesses, spirits, saints, and other female figures who shake leaves. And it's aimed at a younger reader. Mm -hmm. But it, look how beautiful it is. I mean, you can see, look at the cover. It's shiny. And then the pictures are oh, just... Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I worked with this incredible illustrator, Sarah Walsh. Um, and this was incredibly hard to write. I didn't realise how hard it would be. Mm -hmm. But the difference between this and that is... This is like so many of these books that are trying to get women's stories out there that are hugely valuable. It's like 50 women you should know, her story, you know, read a, a chapter about this particular woman. And I didn't want this to be that. I didn't want it to be a potted life of a woman from the past because I've read lots of those and there are brilliant versions of those books out there, but they never really position the individual within, the, within society. They just seem like, you know, an anomaly that, yeah. that just appeared and then disappeared. Whereas what I've tried to do with this is it's quite chronological, it's quite careful, and you can see the evolution of ideas coming through across time and how the women and the men are playing a part in that narrative. Um, so it's as much about you know the people around these, these women as it is about the women themselves. And that's just going to be so incredible for people to read. I haven't read it just yet because I've actually got it. <laughs> I just gave it to her. <laughs> <laughs> to much joy and adulation. <laughs> um, and so we've got A. Raymond in our chapter saying, yeah. pre-19th century, were women denied the opportunity to read and understand Latin and hence be executed for new fishing? Well, this is, again, oh my goodness. I mean, this whole book is about busting lots of assumptions. So I wrote this book, got to the end of it, and I thought, I'm now seeing a period I've studied for decades in a completely different light. I, um, sorry, it's um, A. Ramon, thank you for your question. I thought this, I genuinely thought this, and I thought maybe that's the reason why women have always been the second sex. We are all about, you know, the last hundred years of uh, getting our rights and getting our vote. But that's not the truth. When I actually went back to the evidence, there is a period where women's rights are slowly eroded from the Reformation onwards. And that really accelerates as you go into the colonial era, into the 18th, 19th century, where laws are drawn up to segregate women, where they really are deliberately made the second sex. But that is just not the case in the, the period I studied before that. So no, I mean, so many of the women in here are highly, highly educated and an absolute rival, if not betters, of their male counterparts at the time. Yeah. So I do Hildegard, I mean, Hildegard of Bingen. Have you heard of Hildegard? Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> she, to me, is, is Leonardo da Vinci, hundreds of years before Leonardo da Vinci, and better than Leonardo da Vinci. She is one of the most singular minds that's ever lived. And she was a polymath. She was a, a theologian, a philosopher. She was a scientist. She's the mother that, seen as the originator of natural sciences in Germany. She was a musician. She created her own language, she did art, she did drama, she did, you know, I mean, I can't think of a single human being alive now that does what Hildegard did, and that was nearly a thousand years ago. And she was so highly educated in Latin. You are right to the extent that women were excluded from universities, um, but what would emerge are really vibrant convents. Places where women would go to be together, to become highly educated, highly cultured, and create the art, the, the thoughts of their time. And I think this is an important distinction, because if I ask you, Megan, to think of the word nun, yes. you'll have an opinion, and you guys mm. at home, you'll have an opinion of what the word nun means. Mm. To us nowadays, it's probably someone in their 80s, <laughs> yes. but, you know, in a herb garden, praying all day, maybe a ginger cat floating around I imagine my aunt who's a nun, and she's oh, exactly that. Oh. <laughs> choice of seclusion from the world going somewhere away from everything giving up sex giving up the opportunity for children all the, the, the devotion that that takes to be a nun pre-1400 was the opposite it would be like going to oxbridge you would be choosing to leave behind a life of child rearing where you could die forced marriage um, with somebody that would benefit the family or servitude and instead what you would be doing by entering a convent is you would be in the hub of education, you'd have manuscripts around you, you'd have time on your hands to think, to write, to create, 
I mean, art is made in the convents and science is taking place in the convents. Medicine is evolving in these places. So it is the opposite of what of our modern assumption. But again, you know, I've been studying this stuff for decades and it was only putting this book together where I suddenly, that, that, I woke up to that fact. I just woke up to it that it was a choice to embrace um, a different alternative way of life, but a way of life that was actually quite empowering. Yeah. And, and then again, as I say, after the Reformation, that's removed. The rights of women to be in those sorts of environments slowly erodes. So lots of things changed in those few hundred years. And it leads us to where we are today, which is a time where we still have just a veneer of equality in terms of the, the genders, but also other people who are excluded from society. You know, all the people that we see around us in our eclectic, complex, cosmopolitan world, they were all there in the past. Yeah. And they were thinking like us. That we, you know, we treat the people of the past as if they're, you know, the idiots that just sort of bumbled through their lives like Monty Python and the peasants in the in the mud, you know, but it, that's so not true. They were able to, to challenge things in the way we do today. And some of the women in this book, you know, they are at the cutting edge of politics, of war, of, um, you know, they're involved in everything and looking for them brings the whole, in, whole of that world into sharp relief for me. That sounds amazing and exactly and it's suddenly that discovery of it's not hidden it is hidden history in a way but they didn't exist it's not like they just appeared in the 19th century totally. and as we can see here talking about you know so the rock started in the 16th century and just in europe and we have julia todd mentioning uh christine de Pizan, de oh, Pizan and amazing people like christine. that oh. <laughs> and so i take it she maybe appears she's in not in the book oh no it was quite a deliberate choice um I have chosen a handful of people who are better known, people like Hildegard, people like Jadwiga, people like Athelflaed. And but I when it came to France, I wanted to do the French approach differently. So I went in through the Cathars, through the spies and the outlaws that were the Cathars um, in southern France. And and that was really interesting. And again, that was unknown stories. And it's, it's women who were just mentioned by a name or a, a phrase, but they existed. And once you put them back into the world they were part of. They're there and they're powerful and they're, you know, they're fighting against the system. They're trying to change things. And and so, again, you know, um, I think that was unexpected. But Christine is amazing. And and I think better known, you know, if you want to know about Christine de Pizan, you can go out and find out about Christine de Pizan. Whereas quite a lot in here, you, you simply can't. I've put them together in this way. Um, some of them for the first time that they're appearing in print, you know, so, yeah. That's such an incredible privilege to be part of. Oh, it is. <laughs> and it's slightly overwhelming as well, Megan, because like, I really believe in this book. And, and it was only when I was recording the audio book. Oh. I've never done an audio book of my works. And I was in the studio for three days with this wonderful guy called Rich. And he was on one side of the screen and I was on the other with my, my script up. And I'm reading it out. And in the process of reading it out, I'm putting my voice back into the words um, and nuancing it and, and lifting it and adding all the accents. And I'm reading it to myself going, Good point, Nina. Wow. And then Rich, who was supposed to stay completely silent through the record, he kept interrupting, going, no way. You're not, you're joking. I never knew that. That's amazing. And so by the end of the three days, the two of us were like, yeah, it's a good book. <laughs> you, you know, know it's a good book when you're hyping yourself <laughs> yeah. up. Because you're your own worst critic, aren't you? Exactly. When you're hyping yourself. And, and he was my hype man. He was sort of in the booth going, this is brilliant. So um, all in all, I think, yeah, I have, I have confidence in it. I know it's, uh, you know, I have said all the way through, this is the start of the conversation. This is not a finished piece. I am not an empirical historian. I don't believe I know best at all. I don't have all the facts and all the information. What I want this to do is free up our discipline. So we're not constantly tugging at our forelocks at the guy, you know, the person who thinks they have all the answers. This is the start for all of us, local historians, genealogists, uh, people to go out and write their stories into this narrative. Look at it differently, add it. And I say it throughout the book again and again, go to your local church, go down to your archives, trace your DNA, see what stories come up and add those stories because they're the ones that have always been missing in the bigger narrative of history. We know about the warlords, we know about the kings and the queens, but there were so many other more fascinating people. <laughs> Absolutely, and I know our audience will know exactly how that feels. And I can see Rhiannon Lloyd there saying, in my genealogy work, I do tend to find that there is a divide between higher class and lower class women. How often are they mentioned in the records yeah. and how are they seen by society? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's an excellent, excellent question, Rhiannon. And actually, Rhiannon, you're in my goddess book. There's the goddess Rhiannon appears in there. Um, so I, 
I completely agree. And one of the real problems I had when I was structuring this book was getting a balance because I can write you 2000 words about King Yadiga because she was a ruler. Um, and as a result, there's information about her. But can I give you 2000 words on one of the Cathar um, outlaws? No, because there simply isn't the evidence surviving. But that's why I took this approach of putting the individual almost in the background and building up the story and the context around them. And um, in that way, you get a better sense of a society where lower and upper classes are both playing roles. Um, and as the book progresses, as, as I move on chronologically and I start to get to the 13th century, 14th century, then yes, the last two chapter of this book is absolutely pulling the gaze away from the privileged and the higher echelons and shifting it firmly onto the lower classes, the people from impoverished backgrounds. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with issues of slavery. I'm dealing with issues of prostitution, of, of you know, London as a as a, a city that's just bursting with um, with complexity. Um, and so, yeah, but it's a really good point. And I think I am very honest about it throughout the book. I say, sorry, I am now going to talk to you about a queen because this queen is really interesting. And by looking at her, we can see a bit more about the time in which she lived. But I know it's another high class, top notch, high echelon person. Um, and then I, I try and balance that out in other examples. Definitely, and that kind of links to um, Rhiannon's second question of how you have you found there's still that sort of divide in the work that you've done. And mm -hmm. I think you've just said that there. And it's like you say, when we think about women historically, we often think about Queen Elizabeth and mm -hmm. various people. Yeah, yeah. Those, you know, we think of the classical letters and yeah. those wonderful documentaries on that, which are interesting, but don't necessarily emphasize the full picture of women. Exactly. It's really, really hard because the evidence is, is weighed in the favor of those who had means. They've left behind more and they've left behind beautiful objects because they have the money to commission beautiful objects and beautiful houses because they have the money to afford beautiful houses. And so the, they sway our historical viewpoint. But what I'm doing in this book very deliberately, and this is something I think I was talking to you about earlier as well, is I am deliberately interdisciplinary. I can't box myself. In my academic life. I've taught in the departments of literature, language, archaeology, theology, history, art history, um, lexicography. You know, I've taught across all these different disciplines because I am not a single disciplinary academic. I call myself a historian because that's what I study. My material, my evidence is history, the past. But the evidence I use comes from a range of disciplines. Um, and so I said that the, in the beginning of this book the really big changes that are going to change how we move forward in our relationship with the past are technologically technological advances things like digitization that allow us access to archives things like dna te testing um things that are going on in labs you know mm -hmm. i mean there's a whole chapter now about the burka warrior woman um in sweden and how the dna analysis allowed us to see her for the first time ever for who she was and now all these other women are coming out of the the background because they were ignored they were lost um, so technology is our friend technology is changing the discipline and archaeology and social history those two disciplines that have been there for a long time now but they have always looked for the many not the few it's history that looks for the few not the many so i think bringing the the, the think these things together creates a way of doing history that that we need to do more of going forward absolutely and i couldn't agree more so as a more modern historian looking at the archaeological finds that we find for the 20th century and things like that mm. i then listen to you know someone like alice roberts and her books and things like that and think wow this you know even looking at that century you can't box yourself in because you need to think about what happened before and what happened after absolutely you can't just think i'm going to go this really niche narrow bit and not look beyond it and there's a difference between empirical research and interdisciplinary isn't there totally <laughs> totally oh you are a hundred percent on board here this is exactly it and alice is my dearest friend and we do <laughs> knock these ideas around between us and she's known about this when it was a tiny little spark of an idea so you know we talk about these things and i do work a lot with archaeological evidence and but she would term herself an archaeologist, a scientifically approach um, to archaeology. I would term myself um, someone who works in the humanities and someone who works as a historian. But the bridge is not that distant and our work coalesces because I have always said as a medievalist, I can't understand my period without looking backwards and looking forwards. What a lot of historians tend to do is they go from their point in the future and look backwards to the point they're trying to get to. But they don't tend to think 
mm. forward. I mean, we don't know what's going to come in 100 years and people will look at us as an influence on what came 100 years later. So I think we've been doing history the wrong way around, you know? Yeah. We need to be looking at it much more as this journey, this movement. And that's why, you know, much as I... I didn't necessarily want the book to be chronological. It organically became chronological because I think you see an evolution from the very early uh, individuals I mentioned right up to the later ones. And, you know, for me, that was important that people could, could follow the sort of the, the developments as they were going along. Um, so, yeah, I think I think these things are changing. And I think that when I started making TV, which is 12 years ago now, which is unbelievable to think, um, I was nothing in the discipline looked like it did now. Mm -hmm. It has transformed in a decade, but there still needed to be something like this. There still needed to be a book that just said, you know, this is how, this is how I've done it over these years. And this is how, you know, we can continue doing it and, and you know, throw the ball out, catch it, take it on, do your, do your versions of it. So I'm really proud of it. <laughs> I, I would be so proud of it. And I know when I'm studying research in those hidden histories, and I know our local historians at home will feel the same, you sometimes end up falling in love with a story. Is oh. there any in this book that really stood oh. out for you? It must be really hard. It's so like picking many. a favourite child. Uh, it, it is absolutely <laughs> like picking a favourite child. And this is why I'm so happy to be here today. I feel like I'm with my people. <laughs> local oh, historians, you so are fine. you are the ones that have been doing it. Um, at, uh, <laughs> you're the ones who've been doing it on the ground for so long. You've been doing real social history. You've been doing real explorations to find people from the past in a way that um, a lot of acad academic historians ignore. So I think that this is this is where the real spark comes alive when it comes to people looking around them in their environment, in their local environment. So, um, but yeah, in terms of um, thinking about uh, what you guys all do, it is storytelling, but it's often hard. I had to stop myself because I'm a natural. I love telling stories, and that's why I write for children <laughs> too. I love telling children stories. I had to stop myself being too much of a storyteller because I didn't want it to become all about the individuals and and like i said i didn't want it to be a, a tied together set of bio of you know little biographies of these women but that said i adore hilda gullaby and she comes right in the center of the book and for me she's just oh she's just awesome and everything she did and there's a particular story that um she told which was about um she was i'll, I'll say this is our last story and then i'll, I'll stop but she was um a little girl before she went into a convent and she was walking with her nanny and she said to her nanny, nanny, do you see um, things that aren't there? And she was like, what, what, what? Uh, no, <laughs> it's a little bit like sixth sense, I see dead people, but she was saying, do you see things that aren't there? And she said, because, because I'm looking at that cow over there and she's pregnant and I can see the calf inside it. And it's a white calf and it's got ginger on one side, it's got a patch on its back that's shaped like a heart and I can see it. And the nanny's like, okay, this is really weird. Goes home, tells Hildegard's mum what's happened. Hildegard's mum goes to the farmer and says, when this calf's born, let me see it. Second the calf's born, she runs over to see it. It is exactly as Hildegard described it. And at that point, Hildegard's mum is like, right, you're different to everyone else. And that's when they sent her to become a nun. And for me, that is a little tiny nugget of, of a much bigger story. But I like that. It's a story, I mean, I'm sure it's fabricated. It was written up in her life when she was 80, you know. And so I'm sure somebody creative was thinking, oh, let's make up something about Hildegard when she was a child. But the story itself, for me, sets up what it is that's so extraordinary about her and the time in which she lived. And I think that's the important part of these little nuggets of histories that bring it all together and suck you in and then yeah. don't make you want to leave the story behind. Exactly. <laughs> and then you just keep nibbling away at it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm very conscious that you're going to have to go on stage very soon. Yes. Um, and already you've come in, you've been sat down, had a, barely had a time to have a drink. So we're going to give you some time to relax just before and take in the stage. But thank you so much to our online audience for your questions there. And we will be seeing Nina on stage very soon. We are just going to show you a video while we let her get set up uh, of Adrian Webb talking, to, talking about Taunton Castle. So we will see you in a few minutes. And thank you again, Nina, for thank being you. here today, in spite of all of the odds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Megan. Thank you.